Terrorism is a tactic in which the primary objective is to produce fear rather than direct harm. Terrorist attacks are, first and foremost, most psychological operations designed to alter behavior amongst the terrorized in a way that the actors believe will serve them. The 9-11 perpetrators killed about 3,000 people and did about $13 billion in physical damage to the United States. That's a lot of harm in absolute terms, but not relative to a nation of 300 million people with a GDP of almost $15 trillion. It was a massive blow to many families and to New York City, but to the nation as a whole, that level of damage was about as dangerous as a bee sting. You may find that analogy suspect because bee stings are deadly to those with an allergy, but what kills people is not the sting itself. It is their own massive overreaction to an otherwise tiny threat that fatally disrupts the functioning systems of the body, and that is exactly what terrorists hope to trigger, a muscular and reflexive response on the part of the victim state that advances the perpetrator's interests far beyond their own capacity to advance them. The 9-11 attack was symbolic. It was not designed to cripple us economically or militarily, at least not directly. It was designed to provoke a reaction. The reaction cost more than 6,000 American lives in wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and more than $3 trillion in U.S. Treasure. The reaction also caused the United States to cripple its own constitution and radicalize the Muslim world in a reign of terror that has killed hundreds of thousands of Iraqi and Afghani civilians. The return on the terrorist investment was spectacular. Assuming the official story is right, then Al-Qaeda got $7 million of effect for every dollar it spent on the attack. Seven million dollars to one. The ratio of harm inflicted on the U.S. targets uh, by the 9-11 attacks to the financial harm the U.S. inflicted on itself reflects the same amplification. For every one dollar of damage they did to us, we did 231 dollars to ourselves. For every American that was killed in the attack, we sacrificed more than two on the battlefield. And that is all before we consider the instability we brought to the Middle East, the harm we did to our own freedoms, and the spectacular cost of our, to our reputation abroad. In any case, it's extraordinary and uh, so prescient in uh, unrelated realms today. Right. And this actually is one of the reasons I wanted to read that is because the idea that there are two things in play, there's the threat that you face, which is obviously real. And then there's the question of whether your reaction successfully diminishes the harm. Does it amplify the harm? And this is something that we always have to keep uh, in mind, and as you point out, at this moment, we're not dealing with terrorism, we're dealing with other things, but the same question looms in a slightly different way, which is what is the best reaction to this, and what are the chances that in an effort to uh, to fix our system, we will actually do more harm to it and possibly harm we can't undo. Exactly. And, and we are, you know, we're seeing other countries around the world begin to say, uh, I believe I believe Germany, I believe Denmark, I believe Ira uh, Ireland begin to say, you know what? Terrible disease, awful virus. We're going back to life. We're we're going back to normal life uh, because we feel that we've done what we can do. We will um, hopefully continue to treat. Uh, and uh, you know, I think um, because of uh, laws in Europe, things like planes are still um, you know still have people with masks on them and such. Um, but for the most part, life is going back to normal, even in countries uh, that continue to have COVID. And, you know, this is a place, um, you know, you and I, I think slightly disagree at this point. Back, you know, when we when we published the Substack piece that we did at the end of July, um, laying out what we understand to be, um, our, you know, what we understand to be science's current understanding with regard to um, things like um, um, off-label use of you know repurposed drugs for treatment and prophylaxis of of COVID and the vaccines and how um, how universally um, effective a response that can be, um, we said and I think even the title of the piece was uh, you know we ha we have to we have to get rid of this virus we have to eradicate have to drive it, it extinct, yeah. we have to drive it extinct and. Um, I'm no longer convinced this is possible. Um, I am. I am convinced, and um, I, I think I will remain convinced that it was possible. That it was possible, and it was possible for a very long time, and that we didn't do it. And it's not because uh, some part of the population refused to comply. It's because um, our policies were bad. Um, but uh, given that, it looks like it is an ever more impossible target to actually eradicate this thing, and that we do live uh, with. Um, you know, far worse pathogens, things like things like rabies, 
things like yellow fever. And it's not that those that, that I'm not saying I like those things, right? Or that I think that we should encourage them, but that we live with them uh, with plans in place to prophylax if we can and to treat and to vaccinate if it's possible. And um, you know, the countries that are saying enough is enough uh, are well, let's, you know, let's see how, how it works for them. But uh, so far, so good. Yeah, I, I think in some sense, the question about whether it is possible to drive it extinct has become politicized. And I guess not even possible to know the answer because the data stream is so dirty. Right. And, yeah. you know, I, I'm not saying I'm convinced it's possible. I, I am convinced yeah, it was possible. Yeah. I have seen nothing that tells me it isn't possible. In general, the arguments that people marshal that suggest it isn't possible are not good arguments. And I think the, po the real important point is it actually doesn't matter because if it is not possible, then the obvious objective is to control it as well as, for example, we control rabies, right? Mm -hmm. Rabies is still with us. We have no mechanism for getting rid of it. However, how many people die of rabies every year, you know, within right. the U.S., for example? Yeah. And, and, you know, of course, there's a massive difference uh, in that, uh, you know, rabies has a case fatality rate close to one. It, it is one. I, 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 I think, think there may have been one there's, case. There's, there's a like single, one case there's of someone a single surviving case rabies. of somebody survi well, it, it, surviving su rabies without getting treatment very quickly. Surviving rabies with onset of symptoms. You can right. treat rabies having right. been uh, infected. Yeah, but so it's not going to be the CFR, but yes. Yeah. Uh, at the point that you show symptoms, um, it's basically a death sentence unless uh, unless you've gotten treatment. Um, so it's you know it's a totally different disease, and yet we have figured out how to live with it and have decreased mortality right. to close to zero. Now we're going to take a lot of crap for analogizing the two because obviously they're very different diseases transmitted in a very different way. But nonetheless, yep. the point is complete control of the disease has to be the objective if extinction is out of range. And I don't think anyone actually knows that extinction is out of range. And, you know, it's a discussion that we should be having, unfortunately, because this is a politicized question, depending upon whether uh, various parties are interested in pretending that they have a plan to drive it extinct or thwarting those who would point out that their plan is no good, you'll hear both answers. So right. um, in any case...